creates a big spike on the release of radioactivity. All right, so now what the situation is the following. Uh, reactors one and three have lost those pools, and the fuel is basically destroyed in there. Reactor number four, the same situation. Reactors, I think I wrote it down here, reactors five and six, which again, they're not operating reactors. They're right now, they, these pools are overheating. Uh, the good news is that they, uh, the rod opened, so now they have access uh, by the rod, so they can bring fire trucks. And also, they, I just heard uh, like half an hour ago, uh, just before we came here, that they got uh, electricity. They have electric power now. So those are very positive, very positive news. The question now is going to be, and this morning actually I was trying to puzzle, how do we cool those pools up here? And I sort of had been advising through some channels that I, they consult with me for the government. I've been advising that to be ready, if necessary, to controllably collapse this whole pool into the floor. Because as long as it's sitting up there, there's no way to cover it. And if you cannot, uh, earlier on, about a day ago, I heard, I said, why don't you get helicopters to dump water on the top? Well, they wouldn't let helicopters fly because it was the level of radiation was too high. So that was no gamer. So if, if that doesn't happen, the only other way to do it is to bring the fuel down. And again, remember, the main thing is to cover things with water as deeply as we can. And there is a lot of water there. Now they have access with the fire engines, and they can do that. And then in that case, what would that require would be to basically controllably with explosives to cut out through these floors, the, 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 the floors cut through, and then cut this pool, come down. Another concern that we have, and is not clear yet, is that the, uh, because there is plutonium also in this, some of those are mixed oxide, some of, those, some of this fuel, because it's plutonium, there is a possibility if it is gotten into certain configurations to become very critical. So it can be critical. If it's critical, then it can just go off with, again, going into fission. And that's, that's a very bad thing. We want to make sure we are avoiding that. So uh, the, just very shortly, the message is that I feel pretty reasonable about this area here. Uh, right now, my major acute concern is about this and about all the six reactors. And hopefully nothing will happen to interrupt. Uh, they brought fire hoses that have cannons that they can shoot water at 200 meters. But the problem is that they have so much debris on the top that this water cannot get into the, get into the pool. So now they hope to, and I hear that they're trying to send people up there to clear out the debris. So it's very, very difficult problem. And finally, one last thing to mention is that um, according to analysis were done in this country, again, the, uh, the, there was hardly any cooperation because they basically did not give us information and they uh, sort of held like that. Only now, finally, they said, yeah, we want now to cooperate and, and is now just beginning this process. But already the NRC here, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, took the position that it was a mistake to evacuate only 30 kilometers. Based on analysis that are done in this country relative to dispersal of radioactivity, they say a minimum of like 80 kilometers should have been the radius of evacuation. My concern is that if this problem becomes exaggerated, and if the weather shifts, right now the winds are going uh, east, which is very nice. If the weather shifts, I think we could have uh, real problems. And I'll leave it at that. Let's leave this up here just in case questions we can point to things here. Thanks, Rudy. Patrick? Um, yeah, so we have uh, myself, Theo, and, and <coughs> Patrick and Cray from the Department of History. Um, are happy to, to answer questions. And I think since this is being recorded, it'll all be on the web. Uh, sometime tomorrow, slides and audio. And if we pass you the microphone, then your questions will also be on the web, which I think will be useful. So, yeah. Is there? Yeah, there's a microphone over here. If you could pass that over. How come they are not using robots 
since they cannot take, send people there, they could be robots doing the work of the f fire fighting. Uh, well, uh, remember now, this is all darkened out. Uh, this is, uh, the, the help that is needed is up here. The roof has collapsed in, in some of those reactors. How are you going to use the robots? The, the, our, the difficulty is in getting water up there. And in order to get water up there, either you have to connect lines, and again, this has been obviously, that's why the system failed, because normally these pools are being cooled. The reason that they are losing water is because the heat cannot be removed, and gradually they come up in temperature, they begin to boil. So the robot says it's not an option here. Even to remove the debris to open up so the water could go in? So at, at Chernobyl, the, the people who were assigned to clearing debris from the roof were referred to as bio-robots. Could you extrapolate any of these conclusions to San Onofre or Diablo Canyon, both of which are in seismically active areas? Uh, which conclusions? You say extrapolate conclusions. Uh, you mean what? Uh, we didn't draw any conclusions here except to tell you that there are some problems that uh, still need to be um, resolved for this case here. So Maybe you can rephrase so your question. San Onofre, I think, is a pressurized water reactor. Yeah, so but, but I want to hear the question exactly what the question is. If there were a significant earthquake in Southern California, how much radiation would be released? Uh, San Onofre is in a heavily urbanized area. Um, Diablo Canyon, not so, but they happen to be both relatively close to Santa Barbara, so I'm just curious um, how we might be affected by radiation. Uh, I think I can, I can try this, and you go. Um, a nuclear reactor such as any of those reactors, light water reactors, needs to be cooled after it's shut down. There is always a possibility of an extreme earthquake that will disable systems, just like happened here, that will not be possible to keep cooling the reactor. If that becomes impossible, then there will be a meltdown. The meltdown will penetrate eventually the containment. So in those, because of the design of those reactors, you're not going to have the same intensity as you have, for example, from these suppression pools, uh, I mean uh, the spent fuel pools. Uh, the containment design is also very different. It's a dry containment, we call it, it's more robust. It can take much more pressure. It's more controllable. You can vent it to the outside. If you have hydrogen, for example, the hydrogen will go outside and will explode outside if it needs to explode. So I will say that uh, I, one can envision situations where also pressurized water reactors can show a very adverse response. Because what comes along with an earthquake is not only the damage to some components. The control system is lost. Power is lost. Infrastructure is lost. The problem here was the infrastructure was lost to the point where people couldn't get there with tracks, only just now gained access to the road. So every low probability, what I like to say is every low probability event uh, is sort of totally unexpected. And don't think of something happening in San Onofre or Double Canyon, there'll be anything like this. The question more like is, what would be the other next low probability event that we want to, we must protect against? And that is a much more general question. And what I call that defense in depth. One should have, we have prevention, we have mitigation, we have emergency response, and I've been advocating for quite a long time that we should have basically rock bottom defense for all those reactors. Like every, everything else fails, there is an ultimate boundary a defense. One thing, I, I, I did a study here for actually for exactly this design for the US 25 years ago, uh, exactly for these kinds of things. And we said that if you have a meltdown, you fill, you fill up this area, this, this container, you fill it up with water, and if you did that, you're going to prevent an immediate failure of this container. If you didn't fill it, the melt will go there, will penetrate through the, through the boundary of the shell, and then you get released to the outside. And this became part of the procedures, actually. They have the same procedures. 
However, if you don't have ability to put the water there, so uh, when you have a major event, many other things break along the way. And, and uh, that is why we went in this country for passive reactors, where actually virtually you can walk away. So we have now both uh, pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors that are completely passive. But again, it is not to say that even these passive plants, there will be not be a challenge that will fail them. I've heard that uh, Hiroshima may well underestimate cancers because the living conditions were such that um, only a really robust subset of the people survived to get cancer in the first place? I, I'm, I'm not an expert on that topic at all. I'm sorry, I can't comment. I guess I have two questions. One, we hear a lot of reports about the color of the smoke coming out of the reactor. Um, sort of how can we decipher that information sort of intelligently? And how do you what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, secondly, with the salt water being poured onto the, the containment, what sort of risk do you see with that directly contaminating um, sort of sea, sea life? And if you could maybe expound on what contaminants may enter the water and sort of the causal procedure there and risks? Well, right now, uh, our problem is to get the water in there. And there is not much water leaving the place. It will be a long time before any water actually leaves the place. Ultimately, we have to be concerned about what happens to all this water. We have to be concerned whether the, the melt, uh, because I expect that the melt is going to penetrate this vessel. We maybe already did some of it. We don't know yet. But uh, eventually, I think it's going to penetrate. Because already in two of those reactors, the core geometry has been lost completely. And, and when that happens, uh, there's no way to kill, cool the fuel. The fuel just keeps going down. Okay, and eventually we'll have to come out here. Again, another issue we have with our present reactors, again, I raised that uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but it's too much of a difficult thing, I guess, for the industry and the regulators to deal with. We still don't know for our reactors, and still remains a problem for me, is that if you have a meltdown, whether you can put all the water here you want, whether that will keep the fuel from keep going down into the concrete. We still don't know that. And I had suggested to actually put in some systems that will actually stop from doing that. But that's a pretty serious thing. Oh, that's exactly what happened in Chernobyl. It just the remaining what little was left there even. Most of it went up. Whatever little was left, it kept kept going down. Uh, on the other hand, at Three Mile Island, the the core the core puddled and it stayed in the it stayed in the containment vessel. The in Three Mile Island it came within a nanometer. <laughs> from uh, going uh, through because he just was lucky. He pushed the button and started the pumps and stopped it. About 20% of the melt only actually came down to the lower head and was cool there. Uh, I think in this case, this is not happening. Another thing I should mention that, again, we mentioned this concern, but of course, there's no options at this point. But when you put in a boiling system, you put salt water, and you keep boiling, what happens? You accumulate salt. Eventually, that salt is going to fill up already based on the estimations that we have, how long they've been feeding and how much they've been boiling. There's a lot of salt in those cores. And we don't know uh, how much of it is plugged up. That is going to interfere with the cooling also. Uh, 